Let me kick it off to uh, Isaac so he could do, do some introductions. I am excited to welcome our amazing guest to the program uh, today. So first, uh, I would like to welcome to the program Miss Paula Peebles. That is the only time you will hear us call her Miss. <laughs> <laughs> She is a veteran member of the Black Panther Party, hailing from Philadelphia, also Oakland, California. And she is also now the, the president of the National Alumni Association of the Black Panther Party. Welcome, Sister Paula. Indeed, it's good to be here. All power to the people. And I want to join you in encouraging all those who's joining the uh, Zoom series this evening to send us your questions. We're here to answer them. And I am so happy to see my comrades here from New York and uh, Connecticut. Next, we have Elise Brown. Um, welcome to the, the program. We are honored that you are here. Elise is a veteran member of the Black Panther Party, um, hailing from New Haven and Oakland. Uh, in Oakland, she helped run the Child Development Center that the Black Panther Party uh, operated. So we, we will hear from her about all of those experiences Coming up, welcome, Sister Elise. Greetings, everyone, and all power to the people. Next, we have none other than the esteemed <laughs> Cyril Ennis Jr., Cyril. better known as Brother Bullwhip, veteran member of the Black Panther Party out of New York City, Corona. And uh, Bullwhip, give, give us a shout out. Power to the people there, brother. Yes, all power to the people, and I hope we educate to liberate tonight. Isaac, make more. sure he gets to tell our guest how he got his nickname, Bullwhip, okay? Before we, I guess, get into the, the real questions, but let's get into this Bullwhip. Now, how did you get that name? What happened in the Corona branch, once we had formed the Black Panther Party, being a person that was part was in the military at one point, and I felt that we were an army. This is what we're supposed to be, the People's Army. Yeah, and so I became the, uh, the D.I., which a lot of people who've been in service know is known as a drill instructor. So I was the one who was whooping my comrades into shape, you know, to make sure that we're going to look good, look snappy, look, look clean when we go down the street and when we go doing with our cadence, that we look like soldiers and, and revolutionary brothers and sisters ready to do whatever we had to do. So when the New York 21 bus went down, of course, we had to, we was asked to come from Corona, Queens, Jamaica, Queens, and other branches, and to take, maintain the office, because a lot of the leadership from the, uh, of the 21 came out of the Harlem office. So we got on the train from Queens and rode out to uh, Harlem, got off the train, and when we got off the train, I got all the comrades in line, and we went down marching to the Harlem office in formation. And as we was marching, of course, we was hollering our cadence out, you know, uh, power to the people, off the pig, you know, the revolution has come, time to pick up the gun, off the pig. You know, we were doing this and no more brothers in jail, and, you know, everybody's going to catch hell. So we were doing these um, cadence as we marched on. So by the time we got to the Harlem office, you know, we were really at full steam and Sister Afini was there, and she asked one of the brothers, well, who is that brother? Sounded like that. Just look at him, listen at him, and then listen at the comrade. So one of the brothers said, I don't know who he is. He come out of Queens, sister. So this first time we've been knowing these brothers and sisters like this. So she said, you know what? He sounded like a bullwhip. And when she said that, it seemed like all my comrades said, you know what? That fit that dude perfectly. And from then on, I've been called Brother Bullwhip in the party. And as, and in case everybody don't know, Afini Shakur was Tupac's mother, my nephew Tupac. Okay, the Black Panther Party was organized by Huey and Bobby. Uh, he was in Newton, Bobby Seals, Oakland, California. What was happening was almost mirror to the day. The police was running around, shooting down uh, African-American young men. Um, and really creating havoc in our community. And this was done by the police. So, of course, it became to a point that 
you know, brothers and sisters, especially after uh, the things that went down in 65 during the civil rights movement and everything happening, Malcolm being killed and so forth and so on. So here we and Bobby brought together the Black Panther Party. Now, the Black Panther Party started off as just the Black Panther Party. What happened, uh, Lowe's County in Alabama had a, a figure. And they said, you know, since you brothers and sisters joined the party looking so good, and you're saying the Black Panthers, we're going to give you a chance to have this symbol. So the party was organized. And as the party was being organized by brothers and sisters and everything from the, from the Lumpen, and the Lumpen is the street people, um, we uh, here we and Bobby develop a 10 point platform and program. And from that 10 point platform and program, every Panther had to know this 10 point platform and program. Then we had three main rules of attention, and uh, we had a lot of um, uh, what you would say rules that we had to follow as members of the Panther Party. Now, we were there we were to serve the people, that was our purpose. We were there to serve the people and to protect the people in our community from these police pigs coming in and vamping on, on the people. And so therefore, here we were uh, organized there in California to do this. Now what happened, and, and I guess the explosion happened is when <laughs> Dr. King was killed. When mm -hmm. Dr. King was killed, the Black Panther Party exploded throughout this nation. It became many chapters uh, in many states and many areas. And everybody that was in the Black Panther Party, believe it or not, if you meet a Panther, no matter where you meet him at, you'll come to find out him or her is like-minded people. We were young people that was tired. We were tired of the bullshit that was happening in, the, in our community. And the funny thing, it's the same thing is happening today. Right. It's a mirror of today. Today is a mirror. If they didn't destroy, if they didn't separate us and destroy us like they did with the BS they did, this might be a very different thing today. But because they did and destroyed us and 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 wanted to make people think that we were racist, wanted to make people think that we also was a gang, wanted to make people think that we was criminals and killers and all that shit. No, that's a lie. We were there to serve the people, and that was our capacity, was our love for our people and for the people. Well, I, I just want to say as an extension of that, because we wanted to serve the people, ultimately the Black Panther Party moved to creating survival programs. And the survival programs, that the one that's most well known, is the Breakfast for Children program. And that spread across the entire United States. Wherever there was a chapter of the Black Panther Party, there was a breakfast program. And the, the way it was organized was uh, the businesses within the community would make donations. And we also got monetary donations to be able to purchase the supplemental food to prepare the breakfast. In Connecticut, in New Haven, we had two programs that were really outstanding. Uh, one was at a neighborhood center, the Vanguard Teen Center. And we had community people who served the breakfast. One gentleman, he was a professional chef, retired. He would get up in the morning and he would beat everybody else there to set up the kitchen and get started. Um, we also provided transportation to the breakfast program. Um, one of the things that was truly rewarding over the years after the Black Panther Party, just walking through the community or somewhere in the community, you'd see somebody, hey, sister, you yes. fed me breakfast. Oh, that's such a rewarding feel to, feeling to know that someone remembered you for, for, mm -hmm. for giving them breakfast in the morning. The other program that we had was in the Hill neighborhood. And that was at a place that was like a stone building. I may have been a church at one time, like a granite building. That was the he Jazz, he Jazz Grotto. Now that community over there was very diverse. A lot of Puerto Ricans, a lot of blacks. That was probably the most um, diverse neighborhood in New Haven. Uh, whereas New Hallville and Dixwell together, there was more a little more up, 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 upward mobility. Um, both of those programs provided transportation, and both of those programs had we had community workers, people who wanted to become Panthers, who worked in the programs. 
serving, setting up the tables, keeping the children in order, and they ran very well for a number of years. As an adjunct to the breakfast program, sort of scaled back, we ran a breakfast program in our office at 259 Dixville Avenue. The Panther Party uh, in New Haven had two principal sites. One was on Sylvan Avenue and the other was on Dixville Avenue. The one where we ran the programs the best out of was 259 Dixville Avenue, where we operated an information center. So we published a community news uh, paper out of there. We had layout, light table, all of that. We also had um, operate from there, the busing to prison program. People would stop in before the bus would leave to go to the uh, state prisons. Um, and during the summer, when we weren't so much about serving breakfast before school, we had liberation schools. And liberation schools were all across the nation. Wherever there was a Black Panther Party office, more than likely, there was a, a, a liberation school because our motto, we had lots of slogans. And one of them you hear, heard Bullwhip say, educate to liberate. That was our one of our slogans that we used. Um, and so at the liberation school, which kind of served lunch, we served a little breakfast for the ones who could get up that early. And then we served lunch in the afternoon. Um, and this was this was really my training ground, although I was a very popular person as far as providing child care and instruction of children at camps and things like that in my you know teenage years. This was really my uh, ground where I was able to talk about what the Black Panther Party meant in terms of our 10 point program and platform, how we wanted to um, do things that would expose the true nature of this decadent society by providing uh, transportation to the prisons, the liberation school, the breakfast program. Out of this office, we also had a free clothing program. Uh, there was a brother who would go around to all the dry cleaning uh, businesses, especially the black ones, and collect clothes that they wanted to get rid of because nobody came to claim them. Also, we had a connection on some of the college campuses. When the students would leave, we could collect whatever students left behind and send them to the cleaners, get them cleaned. And then we had the clothing program set up in our office. In addition to that, our office was located in what was formerly a medical office building where black doctors, once they came out of the black medical schools, where they began to uh, start to serve the community. So the doctors had moved off into other areas Black Panther Party acquired this office, which was like a big um, uh, Vic Victorian style building. So it had a lot of rooms in it. We had a liberation school set up in there, breakfast program, but we also had a community room and a library. Next door to us was a ten tenement building where the poorest welfare families lived. And we organized uh, to expose the slum landlord, the conditions that people were in. We had them on the news media. I mean, it was wonderful. We got that building shut down and eventually it was destroyed some years later. But these are the kind of activities that we did to meet the needs of the people. Um, and of course, those children in that building were always in our programs. Um, that was some of my involvement in the New Haven chapter. Uh, across the street, you may be acquainted with the AME Zion Church. There was an AME Zion Church. It's still there, and so is 259 Dixwell Avenue, where we had our office. We had a food buying club where we would organize people to go to the wholesalers, buy, get the food, bring it to the church, and bag it up, and then distribute it to families. And you could buy in your share for a very low amount and get a lot of food. So the Panthers had all these programs, correct? So the United States seemed to, to piggyback off those programs maybe five, ten years later. Why is it that they, do you think guys think that the Panthers now like more or less got a bad rap or not getting credit for any of these good things that you guys did? So I mean so so much of it is just is leather coats and guns versus not the breakfast program, not the sickle cell anemia program. Why do you think a society doesn't promote those things? One reason if you understand if we all know about this system, anything built on this so-called uh European concept of this system does not does not and will not recognize 
anything that the African has done in this whole wide world. Let's not, that's not to say the Panther Party, but in the whole wide world. It has been based, everything in, in this whole system has been based on lies. Nothing but lies and, 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 and inconsistencies of what the true is. Now, as, as, as Sister Lise was saying, they not, we not, we, with everything you said, Amari, that you seen we did, they had to show a negative part to be, keep against us. So they didn't, you see, you remember, J. Edgar Hogg wrote in his thing to his people that we cannot let a black messiah arrive in community. And that goes as far as Honorable Marcus Garvey, and where he was also instrumental in bringing Marcus Garvey down. So we have to understand that that this system, with this systematic racism that is in this system from 14 something, is still here and prevalent to this day. So we were just caught up in the same system that says that we were negative, that what we did wasn't even worth nothing. And then they turn around 10 years you know, later and they co-opt everything, even from the point of, uh, if you look at the welfare of, of babies and mothers getting food and everything, part of that is what the Panther was instrumental in doing as a man card. Feet like Alyssa said, Alyssa said, of feeding the children, giving parents food, milk and stuff. I mean, we were very open and honest in what we did. And of course, that's against this society. And look right. at one of, well, one of the important programs out of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, was the free ambulance program. You know, riding the ambulance is still really expensive. It is expensive. And, and, and the brothers down, and sisters down there, they organized the free ambulance. I mean, that was really exposing, you know, how the system was not working for black and poor people. Well, this question I have for you, how, when, and where did you join the party? And what was your role? My first interest in the Black Panther Party, Erica Huggins came to New Haven after John Huggins was assassinated with Bunchy Carter out there in California. She came to New Haven. Her husband, huh? right, was right. assassinated. She came to New Haven and was trying to organize a, a chapter. And I would attend the PE classes. I was still in high school. Um, but fortunately, I was blessed with the insult that I wasn't there when all that negative stuff went on. But I went out when the Black Panther Party sent out the call to come to California to t attend the Intercommunal Institute. I went out to California and I was assigned to work in the Child Development Center in Richmond. The Child Development Center was in like a ranch building. And it was kind of in the forefront of childcare. I've also managed childcare facilities. We had infants, we had toddlers, and some little, a few older children came around, but these children were Black Panther Party members' children. I'm trying to see if I see my son in this picture. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> As an outgrowth of the Child Development Center, our children would go to um, the school, the Learning Center, which was located in Oakland. It was a dormitory. These children lived pretty much in the dormitories, or for the most part. And we had focus on all of the things that child development do now. But mind you, this was in uh, about 1973. Yeah. So we were in the forefront of child care. The Black Panther Party used to say we're the vanguard. And for a lot of things, we were the vanguard. Because a lot of these programs that you see now, the Black Panther Party had already done them. We set the standard. I joined the uh, Black Panther Party um, as a student, as an activist in the uh, in high school, in the student movement. I went to an all Catholic girls high school, and at the time we were fighting to get Black history in our school. I joined the party in Corona, Queens. Which started off first, I joined Malcolm X Culture Center. It was a culture center that uh, we was having in Corona, Queens. And it really consists of the both uh, groups that was part of Corona Queen, were part of street organization. I belonged to the chaplains, and then there was the uh, other organization that was there. And I joined the center at the time, and I really liked the center because at, at that time, my mind was already developing in 
into who or what I wanted to do in uh, knowing of myself. And I felt that was important to know of myself. And being course, one of my first books that I had read to put me in that frame of mind was Superman to Man by J.A. Rogers. And upon reading that book, I was so amazed at what we have done as African people. Rona and asked us, would you guys like to be Panthers? Okay. And of course, we were doing things in the community as it was with the, with the elders and so forth. So, so we said, OK, well, let us think about it. And I guess we took one day, really, to think about it, because when they came out again, we said, we're ready. OK. Uh, I have a question for you and, and Jenga. Uh, yeah. How, when, and where did you join the party? And what was your role? Joined the party in Baltimore okay. in 1968. I, I joined the party because I went to a place called Soul School in Baltimore, and I was so interested in everything that was reading. They had all these books, and then a lot of the people that came to Soul School were Panthers. Mm -hmm. So I went and became a community worker. And in doing my community working services, I got more enthused and started wanting to be in the Panther Party. So they had an initiation period in six months. We had a lot of reading to do, a lot of studying to do. And you had to prove that that's what you really wanted to do. And so eventually that's what happened. I became a Panther because I did the work. And um, in Baltimore, we had a free breakfast program and we had free legal clinic. We had um, uh, medical uh, uh, services where they tested for sickle cell. And all this as a young girl and coming from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I had never seen, you know, a lot of blacks, even in school. I didn't have a black teacher at, 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 all the way through school. It was just so exciting to be able to go to those PE classes. Not only did you have to learn how to uh, 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 prepare for a PE class, but you had to be able to present it. And while you were a community worker, when you were out in, in the field, the uh, Panthers that you were assigned to be with, they observed whether you were able to um, talk to the people in the community and explain to them, you know, what it was that we were trying to do and what we were all about. And then it was the part of being a community worker to get to the Panther where we had to read different newspapers all over the world newspapers. We go to mm. international news centers and we had to read that. And we were also assigned task of, you know, when you read this, you know, you had to do a writing on it. You know, you had to, oh. you know, it, it was just fascinating. And I was just excited. And so when I really became a uh, actual Panther, and lived inside the headquarters, Baltimore chapter about that time got vamped on. And um, while they were vamping on us, we were sandbagging and trying to keep ourselves alert and keep ourselves uh, fortified and hold our headquarters down without any problems. Um, I just love the fact that my childhood came at the time that I was able to join and connect with the Black Panthers, which has really formulated how I've lived my life. Paula, there, there's a lot of misconceptions about the party. One is that anyone can join. Um, and, the, and the membership was given freely. What's the truth behind all this? Um, the truth is that not anyone could join the Black Panther Party. Uh, yeah. One, you had to be uh, a Black person, a person of African descent. And in order to join the party, you had to demonstrate a level of commitment about um, showing thyself approved in relationship to our survival programs, from the breakfast program all the way up to our political education class. Not only did we have to attend political e education class, we had to be able to carry a political education class based on a specific topic. That's how you show yourself approving that you would be able to carry out any revolutionary tasks that may be asked of you. You had to um, express a willingness to um, support, love, and struggle for the people. That, that was the first and foremost 
um, commitment in becoming a member of the Black Panther Party. You couldn't be a pimp on the weekend and think you're going to come in Monday and be a Black Panther. So um, anyone couldn't join the party. You have to show yourself approved. The people would always provide for us background on people also. So if someone came in there shaky, people in the community would let us know, y'all don't want to let him join your organization. You know, he'd be out there talking to the pigs every other day, or he out there selling dope. You couldn't be a part of our party if you um, supported the degradation and the degeneracy of what was going on in our community. We were there to uplift our people, to educate them through revolutionary knowledge. And so, again, as I said, you have to show yourself approved by engaging in the activity, starting out usually as a community worker and improving yourself and, and indicating to the captain or the deputy captain that you believe you were ready to join the party. One of the ways that you get out there where people can identify you and you also show selflessness in the beginning is selling the newspaper. The Black Panther newspaper was the means of educating the people. And so all of us had to get out there and sell the newspaper. The Black Panther Party for me, and in, in my humble opinion, was a laboratory for all of us who were very young people at that time. You know, me joining the party at 16 years old, still in high school, it was a laboratory for me. So therefore, it is innately a part of my very being. I will be a Panther until I die. I don't know anything else than to be a Black Panther, be a revolutionary in this country, constantly fighting against oppression fighting against institutional racism. That's what a Panther is. That's what we were then. We were students and now we're seasoned Panthers. We know what is going on in America. The Black Panther Party is what caused America to, um, as Elise mentioned earlier, to um, begin to address the most basic needs of their citizens, regardless of their complexion. Children's free breakfast program, sickle cell anemia. We had health centers throughout the nation and we were the beginning of the free health movement. Yes. And there were, there were uh, free health clinics in America, truly free, staffed by licensed doctors, medical students, and volunteers. Huey Newton, when he called us out to California, it was to start an intercommunal institute to help broaden everyone's concept about oppression worldwide, how we stood with Native American, poor people of uh, Latin descent. We were united with oppressed peoples across the world. And if you read the Black Panther Party, Paula worked on the newspaper. Yeah. We did a lot of articles about, about imperialism, capitalism, to educate people. Emory Douglas's art, usually uh, was on the back of the newspaper, but it was always to educate, always to help liberate our people. And that's what the Black Panther Party newspaper was about, to educate, to liberate. That's what we said. And we said, lead by example. You know how your parents would say, uh, action speaks louder than words? Well, yeah, that's what we were about, setting the ac actions, setting that example. Another thing, uh, if you don't mind me, I'm going to get back to the education component just for a minute. Our children, I had Paula's uh, daughter, Fanya, in the Child Development Center. Yep. Our children were, were, were becoming leaders, not even in the, through the Child Development Center or the Learning Center, but just because our focus as Black people was always on education. Get your education. This is how we will advance one another. But our children are, are very, very advanced in their thought, very advanced in their co commitment to making a better world. Mm -hmm. um, two of our children that I had out there in California, one graduated from Yale, came mm -hmm. to New Haven. This was long after the Pet Panther Party. She studied at Yale and another one studied at uh, Yale as well. That one was the son of a prominent uh, party member and the forces were working against it. There's Donna Howell. She worked with us in the school and the mm -hmm. child development. Um, so hopefully our, our kids ha have been imbued, infused 
with our revolutionary spirit and want to continue to help heal this world. Okay, what was the role of education within the party, Brother Bullock? First of all, let's let let us let us let, um uh, I'll read number five first before I go into it. Number five says we want decent education for our children that expose the true nature of this decadent American society. We believe in an educational system that will give to our people a knowledge of self. Mm. If mm. you do not have knowledge of yourself and your position in the society and in the world, then you will have little chance to know anything else. That being said, was a strong point for us as Panthers to do. We didn't just um, have the classes and free breakfast program just to have. We had what we call political education classes. Political education classes is really for the masses of the people so that when we spoke about uh, various things happening within the community and various things happening internationally, we were able to it present it to the people in a form and a way that they would understand. Mm -hmm. It was very good for us because uh, it helped people to navigate to what we were doing and gave them a, a fundamental ide ideology of the Black Panther Party. We also had, uh, besides breakfast program, we had after school program for the children. We were there to help them with their homework and everything. And we knew that some of the parents wasn't there at home to take care of them. So we also did that. So our fundamental thing was to teach our babies their education and to teach the people about what was happening in this system. Now, one of the things that it helped me as a person to do was to get more understanding of self. I realized that you know, it's it's it, it, a tree without roots will not grow. So your roots is your knowledge, Sankofa, going back to what you came from in order to know where you're going. And this was the concept of the Panther Party had of teaching our people what was happening in the world, what was happening in the community, identify the various, um, uh, like Lee says, the critical programs that will help you to speak about the various health, to speak about the various means of what's happening with this country, with other countries, especially during that time, we were there during Vietnam War. So we knew that this was a wrong conflict for this country to be in. And we knew this was this country oppressing the yellow man over there in Asia. And we knew that black and brown folks was being used more so to do that oppression. So we had to definitely speak this to our people. We've seen within the, the, um, in the community, the slumlords was keeping houses underdeveloped, the neighborhood underdeveloped, the community underdeveloped. We spoke about that. We seen the police that was abusing our people. And we, and we identified those police in all the areas that was racist, number one. And that they were only there for one thing that we wanted the people to know, and that was to protect the interests of the ruling class, not for anything else. We wanted people to know this. So one of the things that doesn't happen in school today, and you think about that, is that now here we are today, and they're talking about this so-called critical racial theory to end it so it won't hurt, it won't hurt their children their children don't be upset about it. How dare you gonna tell me now in the year 2022 that our history is now dead and that, that their children should not know about our history? First of all and foremost, they don't even know the truth about the real history of this world, okay? I'm, I'm saying that because it has all, always it has been documented where the first man women came from. So education was a very important part of our of our working with the people is to have the people have knowledge of self and others and what was happening. If uh let's just say that 
the Panthers are having classes, PE classes today. What do you guys think of some of the topics would be during some of these classes, you know, during these classes now? Bobby Seale and Huey Newton, one of the things that they did was they patrolled the police back in the day. Nowadays, when something goes down, we have the advantage of having cell phones, but you got to do it from a distance. <laughs> and that's something that was done in New Haven, too. So I could foresee having some classes talking about how to do that safely. Mm -hmm. Because it's still going on, you know. And a lot of young people need to know what their rights are as far as not responding to police, you know, what their rights are, but also how to carefully uh, observe and what's going on when, when someone is being abused or threatened. Yes. Where did the courage come from to, to join? When you know that what you're doing is right in your heart, then you can stand tall and say, I'm standing mm. for something. Mm. Um, I'm doing something. I'm doing what y'all taught me to do from the church. You taught me to be of service to the people, and I'm being of service to the people. And Mari, I want to say this. It, it's a good question you ask. Where did the courage come from? That's a very good question. You know where it comes from, Mari? After a while of, of living and seeing things as a young person, especially to an outside, we were very, uh, I guess you might say, like the young people see it today, we were very upset at what was going down. And every time you turn around, it was a story of a young black man being killed or, or, or uh, another, like, in other words, every time you turn around, our people was being really messed up by the system. You get to a point that enough is enough. Like Fanny, Sister Fanny Lou Hamer said, I'm tired of being sick and tired. And when you reach that stage, it's a beautiful thing when you find people that is like-minded as yourself. And I was so glad to meet these sisters that you see on here and the brothers that I know to know that we all felt the same way. We were comfortable with each other. The courage was us coming together as a group. Uh -huh. Yes. This is what the Panther Party did. It yes. brought us together as a group. We didn't have to be, a, be a one man as an island no more. We were now the village who takes care of the child. Mm. We were the village to take care of the people. You know, you have a hand and you have individual fingers and each finger has a function. But when we stand together like these fists, like we make a fist, we're stronger. That's what we used to tell the children. And so we're going to stand together like our like our fingers, and we're going to be strong, and we're going to fight the power. No, <laughs> but <laughs> that's true, though. That's true, though. Amen. Another thing is we wanted to stand with the people. One of the things we did, we stood with the welfare moms. Okay, there was a time when the welfare allotment, and they're still whatever they are. But they weren't enough to have back to school clothing. They weren't enough to have food. So we helped to organize the welfare moms and took a bus up to the state capitol so that we could demand in the name of the people, we could demand these things for the families. And that is what the Black Panther Party did. We stood with the people on issues that were concerned to the people, not just our ideas, but their ideas as well. We supported their ideas because we had an idea of what it was to organize, to establish, to initiate. And so where the people had an idea, we helped them organize those ideas into mm. reality, into something concrete that it could benefit us all. We also right. had a program called the 10-10-10 program. In, all the, in other words, you meet 10 people, you, you politicalize these 10 people, you bring in a PE class, you have them there, you, they do everything that we do as Panthers as far as selling the paper, talking to the people, reaching out to the community, and doing something in their building. These 10 people will also organize another 10 people. And that 10 people will organize a, a tenement, a, a 10 apartments, let's say. Those 10 apartment people in 10 apartment will organize another 10 apartment until all of a sudden we have a block. So our 10 10 10 program was basically helping people to organize each other. 
this is something that I don't see within the Black Lives Matter organizations of organizations that they do, that they don't have a set. And this is and when they ask us questions, what we need to do, we say organize. Organization is a crucial thing to make things work. And okay, the so Panthers, the Panthers were organized. That, that, that was going to lead into that question. Like, so these things you guys are saying is that so are these things you guys think is missing in today's organizations? As in, you guys sound like like the tenth and tenth aspect. I don't see that being implemented in in organizations now. Um, the, the, occasionally, the, the, occasionally, you hear somebody say, "Each one, teach one." Where did right. that come from? The Black Panther Party. We started that right. with the ten ten. What uh, Bull Whip is saying: each one teach one. Yes. Or, or even the, the PE classes. Like some people can sit back and say that they're revolutionary minded now or doing whatever, but they don't have the the knowledge that, that you guys were saying. And they're not studying. Are these the things that's missing in today's movements? We used to say there's a, lot, there's a lot missing in today's movement when it comes to organization. A part of organizing is bringing people of like mindedness together to not be afraid. You're going to make that step. See, understand this, Imari, and, and I'm going to be very clear about this, and my sisters will back me if I'm wrong. When I walked out that Panther office with those newspapers, any one of us, we didn't know if we was going to come back at all. Right. I didn't want to sit up here to be the age I am today being a Panther. Truthfully, I'm telling you the truth. I didn't look to be called a veteran or nothing like that because I was willing to die for the people. If this is what had to go down, this is what had to down. Black Lives Matter doesn't see this. A lot of them don't see it because there are things in their elements that have made them softer. They're not hard like we were. We were ready. We understood the conditions that we were in. And the conditions that we're in are, is almost the same conditions today. But young folks need to understand that, that the same conditions that existed when we came through are the same conditions today, but maybe at a higher level. You know, I worked on the Black Panther paper so you, I can tell you how long that took for us to put that organ together each week. But if we had been blessed with what organizations had to have today, then what was mirrored in 2020 under the banner of Black Lives Matter would have been three times, four times as powerful under the leadership of the Black Panther Party. Yes. Yes. Because yes. we had revolutionary intellect, we had courage, we were unafraid of this paper tiger known as United States. And so it would have been a it would have been totally different than what where we were in late 1960s into 1970s. And that girl, J. Edgar Hoover, wouldn't have been able to get away with what he did had we had access to social media. And we did not suppress our sisters, Imari. Our sisters at one point ran the party. See, a lot of yes, people indeed. don't understand that. Uh, the sisters in the party played a good part. But then you got to see, like I said before about education. We go back to education. If you go back to the mother country in Africa, there's various tribes in the mother country that the women picked the men. And see, in our concept that we were doing, especially the East Coast, especially the East Coast, we were very, very, very African conscious minded. I think I think it was a blend too. It was a blend because we had what what Bullwhip said, the lumping, you had the brothers on the street. Brothers who have returned from Vietnam, brothers who have been in the war. Mm -hmm. You had uh, intellectuals. Uh, you had intellectuals. You had students who were dropouts from college mm -hmm. who joined the Black Panther Party. So you had this infusion of of different concepts where people were coming from, but we were united in our thought that we had to improve the condition of our people. We analyzed, we looked at things. This is what I was saying about the critical thinking. We were constantly analyzing based on information that we got. We had um, informational sources that we looked to, such as Sachaba, the organ of the African National Congress. We subscribed to different uh, 
uh, publications so that we could get information. We united with people from around the world when we encountered them who we knew that the, the imperialism and the capitalism were affecting us all. So we're all analyzing this within our organizational PE classes. And we're, we used to say, we're not gonna tell you what to think. We used to say to the children, but we're gonna tell you how to think, how to teach, how, how to think. Mm -hmm. And so this is how we came together. This was the basis of our, uh, we all had a frame of reference from where we came from but we were united in our purpose to serve the people and improve and uplift the, the, our people. Yeah, so there are some questions that um, some of our listeners have. So I'll just put a couple out, um, but then we have we do have a few. Um, so one is to talk a little bit more about the principles of the party. I know we've talked and heard a lot about um, point five, but there was a question about what are some of the other guiding principles of the party? Um, and then and then also there's a question about um, Black Panther parties or Black Panther Party today. What's your you know, does does the party still exist today? Are there other Black Panther parties? OK, let me um, let me let me go through the 10 point platform and program. This was the base. We want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our black and oppressed community. Where I don't want to yeah. interrupt you, but remember at the beginning of this program, you were talking about the principles and policies, rules of the Black Panther yeah. Party. That's what they want to hear about. Oh, okay, okay. So we had we had some principles that we dealt with that um, helped us to um, come together as a people. One of the principles was we do not take a single needle or a piece of thread from the people. We return everything we borrow. These are two highly principles that we did. We believed in this. We did not curse at the people. We did not abuse the people. Okay, that was another set of the principles. We did not disrespect each other as Panthers. If we had a conflict, we had a thing called uh, self-criticism. Mm -hmm. And let me explain that a little bit. Self-criticism is when you are able to criticize yourself for what you have done if you did something that you really wasn't sure. And a comrade or comrades can criticize you that you can accept the criticism because the criticism wasn't to knock you down, was to build you up even stronger so you understand what you did. So we were able to. Then we also have a principle called liberalism. Liberalism is to see something go wrong as a member of the Black Panther Party and not speak on it or not say anything about it because you was a friend of somebody or because you was that person's lover or whatever the case might be. We didn't play that. Liberalism, you had to bring it out so that we could work with it and have the understanding. We had an open self. We, 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 we realized in order for us to be Panthers, and I, I believe Bobby and Huey realized this in doing it. In order for us to be Panthers, we had to have these um, eight points of protection and three main rules. And we we live by these eight points of protection and three main rules. But we still sort of like practice it as as you, as we go along among each other today. Because these are my sisters. The brothers are my brothers. Now, I might have a problem with one or two of them in my own thing. But I suppose to be able to sit down with them and to speak about this. This is right. as Panthers. This is what we spoke about. We supposed to sit down and and work this out together. Unlike young people today, who's carry guns and want to shoot right. the person instead of instead of talk or uh, communicate, they want to kill each other with guns. In, in other words, okay. When I came up as a young man, my older brothers and sisters and them. Well, especially the brothers, they used to thump on us, what we call thump on us. And that thumping made me become stronger as an individual, as a man. That helped me to understand what it is. If I had an argument, we fought with our fists. We didn't use no weapons. And the Panther Party, you better not have pulled no weapon on anybody at all. We wasn't, that That couldn't be. Because we had a little thing in it. I'm going to reveal it, sisters. 
We had a little thing in there called mud hole, and we were mud hole. <laughs> I didn't tell. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you it is. We would mud hole you if you disrespect anybody. The sisters did, and 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 Paul, I think, alluded to. Our sister was just as equal as we were. That's what one of the party's principles. Our sisters was just as equal as we were. Okay, this was how we worked as Panthers. To this day, this is right. how we work. We do give each other that respect. We give each other what we need to do because we know the situation that we're in, even to this day before we leave this earth. So our principles bounded us together. Our principles, our rules bounded us together as a people and some of the things that we learned. We had a little red book. I don't know if y'all ever heard about the little red book. It was Bao Tongue's book. Bobby and Huey got the book at first and we started reading Bao Tongue's little red book. In that little red book, it tells you how to relate to the people. It tells you how to relate to each other. It tells you how to relate to self. There were words of wisdom in there. One, 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 one thing that I remember from the Red Book is a fall in the pit is a gain in the wit. And I've used that over the years. But I just want to say in relationship to the children and teaching the children, you know, children argue. Sometimes they fight over toys and things like that. And I remember trying to be a mediator, you know, sometimes, and, and it was a teaching activity to try to teach the children to respect one another and also be sensitive to somebody else's feelings. And so those same principles that we held for ourselves, we tried to impart to the children. And even yeah. though it was on a lower level, you know, this was important to us. It was integral to our operation as an organization and as sensible adults. Well, you was going to ask the question about New Panther Parties or Panther yeah, Parties now? There's no New Panther Party, first of all. There's, That's no, right. That's there's right. no, there's only one Panther Party. The Black Panther Party, no, in the beginning, 1966, known as the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. All others are fake and gone. And, I'll, and, and I'm saying it, make it be clear, are fake and gone. What you have, a lot of us created what you call Black Panthers Collective of young people. We brought them in. They came in. They, they had PE classes with Panthers. They sat down and read with Panthers. We, they, we showed them how to work in the community, to do work in the community. So they became collectives. They had various different names, but they 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 did lift their banner. What they did underneath the auspice of the black original Black Panther Party. The only thing right now that we have the National Alumni Association, the Black Panther Party, which is all original Panther. I know now we're getting kind of short on time, so I guess we I probably can wrap it up uh, with a question or two. But let's just take it into today, 2022. How can we take some of the things that you guys learned being in the party and maybe give them to organizations that, that are building now, that, that are functioning now? One thing, Imari, that has to be the person that you reach out to, they got to be prepared to serve the people, to really see that they're doing something for the people. Not for self, not for I, but for the people, we, the people. This is what they need to look at to serve the people. When they have organization, it's not all about yourself. It's not all about me. It's, it's, it's not that. It's about serving the people. Fred Hampton said, I am a revolutionary. I am a revolutionary. All of us sitting here are revolutionary. Till the day that I leave this planet and join the ancestors, I will always, I will always be and will be a revolutionary to make changes. This is a concept that people have to take into their mind, their heart, body, soul, and spirit, that they want to make change. They want to do something that's going to make it better for the people. This is the truism of if, what if you want to say to do. You have to make, be able to make the change within yourself. A man who cannot change his mind cannot change anything. 
today, the liberation movement, how people would be able to get involved, as I mentioned to some of the young people last week, was, for example, taking over school boards. You see there's a major move by the reactionaries of this country to take over school boards, banning books and all of that. You need to go on a local level and, and run for those school boards so you can run the educational institutions within your community. You need to be able to challenge the status quo, whether you have city council people on all demands, whatever level is on. Be unafraid. Step out in courage. Organ start off by organizing the block or the floor in an apartment building where you live and then spread your wings and step out on all fours to be able to take on whatever the issue that you have. Um, and, and also you want to look at redesigning um, whatever the local policies and in politics is that's adversely affecting your community. No, it's no time to be silent. You all have much more greater tools than what we have. Put them to work. Be unafraid. Be unafraid. Organize your community. Challenge whomever come up to you. And, and above all, make sure you maintain your Second Amendment rights and make certain that you are, because there's some serious reactionary uh, activities going on. In this and Imari and Isaac, one of the things that I have to, as you heard me say, that critical racial theory, that our people need to stand up and say, no, you're not going to introduce that to us in this country. You're not banning nobody's book. You're not right. banning anything that we had at first. You're not banning this. And these parents in the homes who had these books, you know, to tell their children and have the children, the high school children, the college people, even the junior high school come together. Look, black student unions, make them happen again. Become black student unions in these schools. Yeah. And say, no, we're not going to deal with this critical racial theory. You're not going to hide the truth from the people. You're not going to do that. You're not going to put, say that this didn't happen. It happened. Now let's deal with it. We've used uh, the public library as a forum for coming together. And that's one place where you can gather, you put your tax dollars, pay for it. Hold a, a, a reading session, hold a, a book discussion group with the young people. Talk about some of the issues that are going on. Uh, you can always use the public library. Sometimes there are banned book events where uh, you have an author come in and talk about why the book was banned or whatever to educate, to help us liberate our communities. And Dinga, did you have uh, something you want to add on to that question? I just would like the young people that are listening to know that whatever it is that they can do, they don't necessarily have to do it through a big organization. They can start their own organizations. They can work within the organizations that are already in place. It's just important that they do something, join to do something with someone. Now, are, are you guys like willing to like, let's say that we, we get some interest some, and some, some people want to know like how to get in, get in contact or maybe they need help with some of this organizing? Well, we have an email address for the National Alumni Association of the Black Panther Party, NAAB, as in boy, BPP at gmail dot. Our website is NAABPP.org. Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton used to close out Panther organizing meetings in Chicago with this. White people go back to the white community. Black people go to the black community. Brown Latinos go to the brown community. Our yellow brothers and sisters go to Asian community and begin to organize. And then we would meet at, we would meet at, a united table where we will formulate together a strategy to free all oppressed people. And so that's what I will say to the body here tonight that's on the chat. I think we got to find a better way to give it to the people, whether it's in a written form. I don't know. We got to figure out how to give it to them. But this is, I mean, everything that's been said is like these organizations today, and not, not, not to mean anything negative towards them. We do go out 
nationally to different organizations, as you know this, Imari. Yes. And we would um, go and visit with people um, to try to give them a framework for organizing. We do do that as an organization, as veterans of the Black Panther Party. In the Panther Party, we said no investigation, no right to speak. Correct. So mm. I'm, saying it. I'm saying it. So I did investigation, so I know I have the right to speak. There is no way that we're going to let this critical racial theory go down and ban books and tell people what they can read and what they cannot read. If they don't understand anything about it, there's a movie out called Fahrenheit 351. Yes. Who spoke about things like this happening. You already have a front line to look at something to do. You're out there as Black Lives Matter then part of Black Lives Matter is them taking away your history mm -hmm. and not letting your history be told. That's part of Black Lives Matter. Another part of Black Lives Matter is to explain to others our history. We have our story. We have heard that story. Now here's our story. Uh, in the absence of being able to talk one-on-one -on -one with us, Talk to some of the older people in your family. Talk to your grandparents and ask them, what do they think about the struggle? What do they think about the Black Panther Party? You know, I think a lot of older people will appreciate, I think, younger people being inquisitive and trying to have a relationship with them. You know, the, the older people have something to offer. Yeah, I think, uh, and hopefully, the big takeaway for everyone who's listening is that Whatever movement you're involved in, whatever your cause is, you must have an education component. You must politically educate yourself. You must politically educate your followers, your membership. Whether you have a mutual aid organization, whether you're fighting climate change, whether you are protesting police brutality, or any combination of those things, you must have an education component. Um, the Panthers who've been here tonight have uh, eloquently shared with us the ways in which they educated themselves, educated others. And so I think anything that you're doing must include some element of self-improvement, of teaching and learning, and, and of improving uh, one's own intellect so that you can become of more service to, to your community. And I think to build a little bit more on what uh, Brother Bullwhip said, when we talk about education in a literal sense, as in the schools in your communities, <laughs> I would recommend going to a parent-teacher organization. In Chicago, they're called local school council meetings. <laughs> Wherever you are, you have probably a different name for those. But ask the principal, ask school leaders, what books are students reading out of? Interrogate those lists. Ask your child's teachers what books are my children going to be reading this year or this upcoming semester? And make sure that those books represent both the, the heritage of your family, but also diverse uh, heritages and cultures from all over the world. Yes. Um, so that your children are getting a, a well-rounded education, especially for, for black children and children of color in this country whose experiences are terribly underrepresented in public schools. Um, especially for, for white children as well. I'll speak directly to, to, to my community. We, we can learn the most by, by studying the experiences of other people who look different from us. Uh, and so we must push on our school leaders, on our principals, on our teachers um, to make sure that our curriculums are culturally rich. Um, and as we close out with just a few, we leave you always with some other uh, with recommendations for you to, to advance your own your own reading. So here are a few books. That, we've, um, that we recommend, and I know that our, our panel may have others that we've missed, but if you're interested to learn more about the, the Panther um, education programs, um, these are some books that you can, in, you can investigate further to, to a little bit learn a little bit more about the, the survival programs of the Panthers, the education programs of the Panthers, or the day-to-day the -day experiences of the Panthers uh, themselves beyond what you've heard today. So these are those books. Uh, we urge you to, to go and pick them up. And again, as I mentioned, I'm sure that I'm missing some that, that our, our uh, panel here might recommend. So um, I guess that's what I will close out with is, is there any resource, is there anything from our panel that uh, you recommend that our, our listeners go and pick up that so that they can further educate themselves about um, your wonderful history as an organization 
and the ongoing work that, that you're doing today in your own communities? Anything else that you recommend that they go and find? Well, one of the books is the book that um, Brian Seitz did is The Unfinished Business. Mm-hmm. That's a book that will give people a chance to uh, be able to read little things that we offered in the book as we took our portraits that we did as members coming in at the party or what we did in the party or who we are in the party and some of the things that we did and some of the comrades that's in there is no longer here now, but to even read their story. And it will give you a fulfillment of us as Panthers. You know, <coughs> our, our whole, you know, part of our coming in and, you know, why we joined the party and the things that we did or learned. And, you know, and it shows our picture, who we are and so forth so on. So everybody here that's on this right now is in that book. I guess we'd like to thank you guys for uh, spending uh, some time with us tonight. Hopefully everybody will have a chance to come back with us next week, Thursday. February 17th, as we spend another uh, a night with the Panthers and we talk about uh, solidarity um, with some of the veteran members of the Panther Party. All power to people. All power to All people. All power to people.